I'm Matt Landau from VRMB, and this is Unlocked, Season 9, Home Runners. Today's episode features Matt Durrett, who runs Cozy Vacation Rentals in Fredericksburg, Texas, aka Texas Wine Country, with his wife Jenna, who used to design gear at Under Armour and now designs vacation rentals. Matt and Jenna run Cozy with Emily Reed, who's the integrator of their vision. We'll talk about what that means. And Matt and Jenna and Emily run Cozy with this incredible team that more resembles a family. And this family's market has blown up over the last decade, but really accelerated post-pandemic in such a way that Cozy has grown to more than 300 properties. They're taking on an average of 10 new properties every week. In its early days when raising money, a specialist referred to Amazon as the quintessential wave rider. And I now use this phrase to describe certain home runners like Matt who are positioned thanks to a combination of hard work and vision, sure, but also sheer timing. They're positioned to be the biggest winners as our industry evolves. But you do not have to be big like Matt to be a quintessential wave rider. In fact, today's conversation covers limited edition positioning, entrepreneurial operating system, one of Matt's big game changers, his tech fluency, and his hospitality style. These are all things that you can do no matter your size. In fact, probably the smaller, the better. We also spend quite a bit of time talking about the biggest threat that Matt nor other quintessential wave riders would have never planned on, but are now actually primordial to their survival. Today's episode is brought to you by Point Central, the leaders in smart home automation, and Breezeway, a property care and operations platform. And as with every episode this season, we kick off by asking Matt, what does the phrase home runners mean to you? So the phrase home runners means to me, as it relates to the short-term rental industry, is a, a collective group of individuals that are clearly knocking it out of the park in their destinations in which they operate in. Uh, I think we're all so unique, but we all still do the same thing, right? We're still renting out homes, apartments, condos, timeshares, townhomes, villas, you name it. But we all have some sort of secret sauce that is making us so successful um, as independent operators. And that secret sauce to me is really what makes someone a home runner. Um, and, they, and we all have it. And uh, I think in our industry that those are the true home runners. And you look in every single destination market, there are key home runners in that market who are, are really just doing things uniquely and really have a unique value proposition where they truly are taking care of the the homeowners and the and their customers, their guests and their employees. Um, and uh, it, it's pretty fascinating to watch. That, that would be my definition. So talk to me about your special sauce. How would you describe that to someone? I think our special sauce really comes down to our people. Uh, for the longest time, I tried doing everything myself, and I think that that had a lot of value addedness in terms of you know learning every single tool, um, understanding the industry inside and out. But if you're really going to build something special, you have to build a phenomenal team that is going to allow you to service you know, your customers, your guests, and your homeowners. And that really, I would say, is our secret sauce. When you when you really look at our team and how we've built that out and the size of our team and this unique roles that touch every pain point of our business, that, that would be our true secret sauce. And how do you, so I think um, everybody wants to have a special sauce in which the team is the difference maker. What have you learned along the way is the secret to building that team? Because hiring the right people and keeping them engaged and motivated and passionate is hard. It's, it's extremely hard. And that's been one of the things that I have learned the, the, the true hard way over the last 
almost 10 years of doing this. I made up a, my mind about three years ago that we were going to stop being a reactionary business um, and we were going to work towards being a proactive business, implement new operating systems and get the right people. And going down this path, it truly has been from our, our, our starting of the EOS entrepreneurial operating system. We went down this path almost two years ago, deciding that we were going to do it. We've been implementing it for the last year and it allows you truly to instill accountability and operating system across your enterprise where it puts the right people in the right seats and it, everyone is on the same page the entire time you know, going to the, to the company's mission. But it's really key during this to find the, you know, find the right people, right seats. And a lot of that is changing how we hire, you know, using agencies like better talent, using predictive index, culture index. Uh, it's pretty fascinating what a culture index or pre predictive index will really tell you about the scientific operations of how someone really operates and thinks and their personality. What's like an example that you learned about someone you wouldn't have known previously? So someone that I wouldn't have known previously, let's see. Um, I would know, for instance, as even, even myself, uh, taking my, taking the culture index myself, I'm what's called a daredevil. I just drive, 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 go, go, go. And I figure it out along the way. I didn't realize I, I was doing it right. And I keep just growing, 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 growing. And my assumption is always that the road will always be there. And somehow it always is. But when I look back, I wasn't paving the road. I needed someone that could actually help me pave that road, who can integrate what I'm growing. And that was one of the key pieces missing was I kept growing this thing, but we, we, there was no path laid out for us. We were figuring out, and that's, that's, it was kind of fascinating even reading it myself, but yep, that is uh, that's spot on who I am. Um, and it really teaches you, you know, where you're lacking and kind of what your personal weaknesses are. And, that, and that's okay. Everyone has weaknesses, but it allows you to know the right people you need on your team. I think that would be a good example. So when you learned that you were a daredevil, did you look at yourself in the mirror the next morning and say, I am a daredevil? No, I, I, I looked in the mirror the next morning and said, we've, we've got a, a big problem if we continue down this path uh, because I'm not setting my team up for success operating a business where we're putting growth over process. And that's, that's really what I looked at the mirror was we, we've got to get this right. Um, and, you know, a lot more failures will come with that, but we have got to redo this entire company from, from the top down. Um, and I, I was not doing our business justice by trying to sit in the operations seat. And I want to talk about uh, EOS a little bit later. I want to talk about your integrator who has changed the face of your business as well. Uh, but really, I want to talk about that moment in which you realize we're going down the wrong path. I've got to change. And you said your moment uh, was in determining you didn't want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. But I think it's just the moment period of recognizing that change is happening and I need to make a decision, more broadly speaking, you're, you seem very decisive in those kinds of, in that kind of face of change. And I'm curious, what was the moment in which you decided to shift your focus from Baltimore, which is where I first knew you to be a vacation rental professional, to this new region uh, in Fredericksburg outside of Austin? I truly think what what really I'm so thankful for my time and time in Baltimore because I would not have realized a what the vacational industry was. Uh, I'm that quintessential story of just operating an Airbnb, you know, thinking Airbnb was the absolute you know king. Hey, I'm a host, and um, you know, Matt, when I met you in 2018 at the uh, vacational success summit, that kind of changed my entire thinking about what the vacation rental industry was, and I was like, hey, I'm actually a property manager with close to 50 homes at this point. And the move to, to Austin was, uh, you know, to the, to Texas was to be with my wife's, my wife's family. And we built out all the right systems in Baltimore to keep, you know, running that business healthily while I was still, you know, essentially running it from a kitchen counter, uh, from Austin when my wife, uh, 
was still working um, in the apparel and design industry. And we started slowly growing, you know, homes in Texas and, and really looking at, at the, at the data was, wow, this is a phenomenal market. Um, you know, you have a casa in this market, you have all these big operators, the revenues, the huge homes and, and how much demand there really was is kind of what really changed where, Hey, you know, I kind of want to add some homes here and slowly grow, but that wasn't where I, I was looking to truly build a company. And it was just, I want to add homes and add homes because it really came down to revenue and I loved not only, Hey, the revenue is great, but also the people that we were kind of growing. But what really, I think, put me in that pressure mode, um, you know, when you're fate, when you're, when you're put in adversity and stressful situations, I, I think human beings do a great job at actually really figuring it out. I think that's why we have that, that, that defense mechanism. And when I've been put back up into a corner, I've been able to, usually work my way out of it. And it's not easy. Um, but when COVID happened, you know, in March of, of 2020, um, our business got flipped on its head. Um, within about three, three months, we lost half of our portfolio, um, in Baltimore, um, and, and up and down, we had homes up and down the East coast as well. And in the little micro markets we were trying to expand into and all the cash, you know, immediately started to drive in terms of income coming in. And all we had were savings. Uh, that was the point where I knew we, we had to do, we had to do something. Um, that's when I immediately started the, the cleaning company to provide for our cleaners in Fredericksburg, Texas, that were still out of, we had about 15 homes right at that moment. Um, you know, Baltimore, again, that dried up, but we did the cleaning for about two or three months, kind of monitoring the market because everything dried up. And then it was truly this wave of just growth in terms of guest demand, but also owners wanting to buy, wanting to look for management companies around June, 2020. And that's when I, you know, I just put my head down and said, we're just going to add home after home after home, because as you know, we also have, you know, our entire customer service and support and backing roles team that's based out of Honduras and those folks I had to provide for. Um, so I did nothing. I cut, cut my entire pay for that whole year and we put all of our investment uh, every dollar we had to grow into Fredericksburg, Texas and the Texas Hill Country. Um, and at that moment, I knew, you know, I wanted to run the company differently to truly build a brand new business that was going to survive, you know, through uh, any type of pandemic that really was going to be based around the team versus me being at the top, kind of making decisions and trying to run a business remotely. Um, that was really the key moment though was, was COVID and through those first three months of just probably the stressful, most stressful time of my life, trying to figure that out. Um, uh, that's really what put me against the wall to know that we had to build something different and that in Texas, it really does come down to hospitality as more in the urban space. It wasn't about hospitality. It was, it was truly guests wanted to be in and out of those rentals, convention center, business travelers. Um, but Texas, the culture was different and we, we really needed to grow a brand new business to meet the customer and homeowner demand. How long did it take for you to buy your first pair of, uh, cowboy boots? Luckily, my wife gifted me a pair of my first boots, uh, in 2019, when we, we got married in Dripping Spring, Texas, out of, out of Austin. She actually gifted me uh, my first pair of boots for our wedding. Okay. So you were showing up to your meetings. You were showing up to your meetings like a local. Yes. Yep. Like a local. All right. And you breezed over something else I think is fascinating about your business. That's your Honduran staff. Um, for those who don't know, Matt basically built a, a remote team that is able to handle a lot of the jobs, not all, but a lot of the jobs that otherwise he would need to be hiring locally. And I'm curious, Matt, do you think just anybody could pull this off building a remote team like that? Or in hindsight, do you think it was your very special alignment of stars that made it happen? Anyone, anyone right really could go and do that theoretically. Um, but this took so much time, effort, trial, error, failure. How, you know, how is this really going to work? Um, and you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to, you know, my, my brother owns one of the top eco, eco lodges in Honduras. So the connection was already there. Um, 
And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to travel to that country, you know, over 20, 20 times to experience the culture, understand the culture and really have a lot of pride for that, that culture, that country. Um, so it took, took many years. And what people understand is our team down in Honduras has been with me the longest out of anyone. Um, you know, we set that team up starting in 2015. Uh, it's now we're going into 2023. So that's been the longest core of our business going on almost eight years at this point that's been with us and through trial and error, it was, you know, it, it used to be just, Hey, you know, customer support, answering the phone. Um, you know, I would ship down, you know, a Google, they have what's called a Google Fi cell phone plan. It was a, it was a global cell phone plan. I'd ship down a phone, computer, you know, laptop, et cetera, allowed the person to work from home, set them up inside of all of our accounts on the back end, And then they were completely plugged in. Um, to everything that we're doing. And now it's, they're completely plugged into, you know, we operate on track and our entire you know, call center, customer support, ticketing system, everything's built through there. You know, all of our agents are certified by, you know, Doug Kennedy you know, training program, you know, ho- as part of hospitality certification. Um, so we've, we've, we've gone from, if you look at the evolution over eight years from a Google Fi cell phone plan, and now we have our, our entire customer service support supports team as a, as a division with 15 individuals who do everything from financials to call center, to accounting, to listing audits, um, and special projects. So it's been, been a phenomenal process. And I, I think a lot of it really is our, our secret sauce because we've built up such a great team that people in Honduras really want to work for, and we provide phenomenal benefits and everything like that, and to make this a great place to, to work. So I think it would be very, very hard for someone just to go and hire someone. Um, they could they could have their work, but what, what our team values most down there is our culture, and they want to work for a company they know that is on a mission and growing and that they feel a part of, and that's what, that's what we've done down there. So I do think it's a little bit of a secret sauce, and it would take someone several years to get it right. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Uh, you also mentioned EOS, and for those who don't know what EOS is, I only recently learned about it um, at the Keystone Retreat, and I'm now kind of immersing myself in it. Explain to other vacation rental operators who want to grow first what it is, and then I want to go into some examples. Sure. It, and it, it took me kind of a while to understand it in our industry everyone immediately will jump to, is it a piece of technology, right? Is it, is it, is it a piece that goes into your tech stack? Is it some, some new tool? Is it this? And the simple, simple answer is no. It is, sim- it is simply a theory and also a model to base your business on and to how to operate your business. Um, we're on, it takes about two years to implement. We're in the first year of doing it. We started in January of uh, 2022. And it's a way to bring accountability across the entire enterprise of, of your company. It allows everyone to understand where your company is going and it instills accountability across your entire enterprise. It allows you to actually pull the levers of your business versus being reactionary, which we were. You know, it, it, and so what that means is no more whack-a-mole um, and I, no more just reacting to problems, problems. You really have systems that you put in place and it starts from top down from what's called a leadership. You set up your whole entire leadership team. Every single meeting across your company is ran the exact same way. So it's a system on how to operate all of your meetings it's a system how to reset all your company values. It's a system on how to reset your one, three, and 10 year goals of where your company wants to go. And then you flow down that entire mission and you get everyone bought on board in your company. There's no, there's no questioning on where this company is going or what we're here to do. And if you're, if you're not, you know, Hey, if you're not on the bus, you know, then that's fine. You can hop off of it. This is where we're going. We've all agreed on that. And It also is a great way inside of us. They're called rocks. They're essentially goals and you operate your business every quarter. So you, you measure goals every quarter 
and you meet together with your different teams each and every single quarter to go over your, your rocks or your goals, but you measure those rocks with those team members each and every single week. So over the course of 13 weeks, you know, if you're going to hit those goals or not, and you set anywhere from three to five goal, you know, goals or rocks per person. And at the, over the 40 staff members that we have, if you think about, Hey, everyone has five goals each quarter and EOS, it's all about accomplishing 80% of what you do because perfection does not exist. So you want to hit, have the baseline at 80%. So if you're accomplishing if everyone, all 40 people, right, are accomplishing, um, you know, four out of five rocks and goals each, each quarter, that's some, you know, that's 160 new problems that have been solved and that lead to your growth. And now you quantify that across each quarter and there's four quarters a year. Think about all the challenges and major problems that your company is tackling together. And it's all public across everyone in your company. And so it really brings that accountability. So is it something that you pay for? <laughs> I'm still trying to understand. Like I, I, I try to wrap my head around what is it a company? So, so it, there, it is called EOS Worldwide. Um, and EOS Worldwide, their mission statement ultimately is to have over 100,000 companies run on an EOS model. And it's a, it's a book that's by Gino Wickman. He wrote in 2012, it's 2012 or 2013 called Traction. And it's really what really started this EOS and brought it to the mainstream. Um, I believe right now there's over 20,000 companies that are operating on this model. All different kinds of companies. All different kinds of companies. I mean, uh, but I really find it very value added for operational or service based companies where very, very logistic heavy, very people and customer support heavy, where it works the best. Um, and with EOS Worldwide, you can pay. It's it's a whole model to follow. You can pay for what's called an implementer, which which we have, and I highly recommend you to do. Um, uh, How much does something like that cost? So it's about a hundred thousand dollar investment. Wow! And out of everything I have ever done as a business owner, it's the number one investment that I have ever made as as a business owner. Out of everything, and it's not a software, right? It's very hard to tie back to to revenues and, and mapping it back and um, things like that. But our, our implementers out of Dallas, her name's Amy Johansson, and she has no experience prior to working with us in the vacation rental industry, but she has phenomenal experience of you know, growing the company from six to seven figures and then 10 exit um, and running and leading uh, uh, you know, her own company and now as an implementer. And what we meet with her each and every quarter as a leadership team to measure our leadership team's goals, uh, to where we're going, to doing leadership offsites and really stepping what's called stepping out of the business to work on the business. And a lot of companies, you know, we were thinking about not hiring an implementer because it's, it's very expensive and it's really hard to justify that cost. It's extremely hard. Um, it's $7,500 per day that we need as a leadership team. And to just for that cost can be, it can be expensive, right? So a lot of companies will try to self-implement um, and to do it themselves to save. But the problem is we can be our own worst enemies, right? If you put a whole leadership team together, our leadership team is eight people. Uh, and we've identified the key eight functions of what our business operates, the different divisions. But we're all operating in the business each and every single day. And when you come together, it's really easy to get off track. It's really easy to go, to go down rabbit holes. Um, we have a lot of biased opinions and different departments and what this person should do. So this implementer really allows us to have healthy arguments, to keep us on track, to have constructive dialogue and really bring the discussion full circle and to, to really own what we've come there to do and is to continue to drive our company to where we're going. If that makes sense, it's, it's, it's truly just a model of how to operate your business. So is it designed primarily for businesses that want to grow? Like somebody who's small, who's, who simply wants more structure and wants to step out of their business so they're not inside of the business. Someone who's not looking to, to build exponential growth, is it not for them? I'd say yes and no. 
Um, I think it, it really can be a great model for the folks that truly they want to sustain, you know, their, their business or what's called a family business. You know, they're not looking to necessarily grow, Hey, a hundred units next year. Um, but it also is, is a great, great model for, for yes, sustaining because you get to measure your business consistently. It's a way to measure all the key KPIs and metrics and tracking and setting goals and operating truly bring accountability to allow your company to truly be the best it can be regardless of growth. And, and what's amazing though, is you really reset, you reset, we, we redid all of our company values. You know, we redid our, you know, one year goal, our three year goal, and we had a five year goal. We, we, you, you kind of X that five year goal and you go, what, what does that kind of 10 year target look like? And those targets don't have to be, revenue based or unit based or anything they can simply be you know our our next year goal as an example is we want to be the top employer in Fredericksburg Texas with the best employee benefits that's our one year goal that's going to allow us to hit by having you know what we decide of happy employees etc will allow us to hit a certain revenue number so you you can you don't it doesn't have to be for growth but it really helps you be accountable and our leadership team has already changed you know we had we had we had uh, eight people to start we have four new people on the leadership team since starting because it allowed us to know that hey those folks they were not the right fit with where we've all agreed to you know to go you know on this mission here at cozy and that it can be really uncomfortable but it allowed me where we've come now it was it was all the right moves and and it really brings a lot of those those uh variables to life that you need to make you know, decisions and changes on. So we talked earlier about you establishing yourself as a daredevil by looking straight in the mirror and talking to yourself and that you needed an integrator who would begin to materialize the visions that you had. And that is the wonderful Emily Reed, who uh, I've no also known for a number of years and really works with you like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, you guys are almost more partners than um, than a boss employee relationship. But one of the things I was talking with Emily about is how, when you do choose to invest that amount of money, a lot of money that was not already on a, a budget, it wasn't part of the business plan. When you choose to invest that level of money in something in a deep process, it almost like forces you to, <laughs> to get your money's worth. It says like, you, you can't really escape it. Right? No, you, you can't. And uh, that's what I said earlier is when you're, you, you're not necessarily back in the corner, right? But it creates a bunch of stress that in a good way, it's great. I look at it as fantastic stress. I mean, I, I you know, call it growing stress. And uh, I think it really, it holds you accountable as well when you make that investment that there is no going back. We are, we are doing this and it's, it's a calculated risk, but it's been the best, one of the best risks that we, that we've taken. And now a word from our sponsors. Point Central provides smart property solutions for smart vacation property managers. They help streamline operations, protect the property and enhance the guest experience using keyless access. Why? Because guests are tired after traveling, duh, and being able to go directly to that property with keyless access instead of stopping at a manager's office, this is no longer a luxury. This is a standard practice. Plus, everybody loves avoiding extra trips due to lost keys, not to mention the constant cost of rekeying. Point Central partners stay aware with an activity log of who enters and leaves the property, which helps keep track of cleaning and maintenance crews as well. You can also gain control of your utility bills with their smart thermostats. Schedule set points so guests won't be able to drastically raise or lower the temperatures, for instance. You can ensure the temperature stays consistent when the unit is vacant. Prevent costly maintenance projects caused by water leaks, mold, or HVAC issues with real-time alerts that allow you to be proactive. Visit pointcentral.com VRMB to learn more and Breezeway, whose property care and operations platform helps you coordinate, communicate, 
and verify the detailed work and deliver the best service experience to your guests. With tools for intelligent task scheduling, quality assurance, real-time work coordination, guest messaging, supplies management, owner reporting, and more, oh my, Breezeway helps thousands of short-term rental managers and hospitality operators increase your operational efficiency and eliminate hours of manual work. This allows you to boost your service revenue. It was created by the founding team of Flipkey, which was since acquired by TripAdvisor, and Breezeway is just elevating the experience at every property they touch. Visit breezeway.io slash VRMB and get implementation fees waived. That's a $1,000 value right there. Okay, let's get back to the show. So calculated risk, that's a really cool um, segue into this topic of regulation and advocacy. And from my years working um, with storytelling and, and to promote the best of what vacation rentals have to offer, I basically concluded that unfair regulation is coming to every destination, uh, whether you like it or not. And I think there's destinations that are especially hot because of a variety of reasons. And in the case of Fredericksburg, wine country, I had the chance to visit you out there. It's just exploded in popularity. And it's not solely due to vacation rentals. It's due to all of these societal factors on the heels of COVID and spaciousness and the wine industry and all these things. So how do you view regulation, uh, perhaps removing your cozy hat for a moment, as it relates to short-term rental investment at scale? In Baltimore, there was some severe regulation that was coming through for the entire year of 2017. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to go through that process to really see how damaging regulation could be. I think it hit a lot of urban markets likely first, just from my experience. Um, but I really, the amount of time that that took from, from me and running my business to try to you know, save the, the industry there locally, et cetera. And we had you know, the hammer crack down on, on no more new homes, no, you know, no, no new permits. Um, everything was grandfathered in, but at, you know, if you were to sell your home in Baltimore, you could never transfer that license. So really, really damaging restrictions there locally. And we were very fortunate to uh, you know, still have a good chunk of homes in our portfolio. We're still able to grow through people who did have already licenses, but um, that did, that taught me a lot. Um, of just city politics, how things, you know, are, are ran in terms of the advocacy level. And it taught me a lot about, you know, affordable housing, um, you know, low housing vacancies and, and things like that. And all the different economic factors that really go into these decisions at the city level. Um, going into, you know, uh, Fredericksburg and investment, I think what's different about Fredericksburg is it, it is we're, we're lucky that it's a very small city limits and most of the growth is act most of the growth is actually in the county but for the last year and a half you know we've been going uh, constant city council meetings there's been continued um, you know regulation changes uh, locally and everyone said for for years regulation will never come to Fredericksburg and for the first two years of operating there, that was the same, my same opinion. Oh, regulation is not going to come here. This is a tourist town. It's Texas. It's Texas, right? And boom, it came full speed. Um, and you want to talk about being at city council meetings from 5 to 12 p.m. every two weeks for a year straight, essentially. Um, you know, consistent, you know, changes from planning and zoning meetings to city council meetings to really try to shut the entire industry out of Fredericksburg and put, you know, and take away permits up to a certain extent. And then for some, you know, they were trying to implement sunsetting clauses to get rid of the entire industry here. And none of that passed luckily. And, um, you know, the, the three page ordinance back in April of, uh, 2022 this year went from three pages to 107 pages in a short term rental ordinance. And no one knows how to, you know, how to truly, 
read that document. It's, it's really up to interpretation. And it really, not only it's drained the entire city here and their resources, but you know, luckily the industry can still grow and still operate. Um, but it has put certain restrictions in um, that I do believe were needed in terms of guest occupancy levels and you know quality and, and following the permitting process and ensuring that homeowners are held accountable you know, to, to be a, a good neighbor to the community as well. Um, but it really not only impact, obviously, investment decisions, you've, you've got to be very savvy on where you, not only where you invest, but at the, at the same time, Fredericksburg is still, it has such, you know, such a tiny city limits that again, most of that growth to your point is in the county where all the liners are going. That's where the tourism is going. Fredericksburg is still a tourist hub, but for people who do not think that regulation is coming your way, you're you're in for a rude, rude awakening because it, it it is, um, and we we have felt that firsthand here. You said that it came like a tidal wave or something like that. What were some of the first little indicators, the earliest glimmers? The, the I mean, how it came like a tidal wave was I'll never. I mean, this was back in I believe it was June of 2021. And the city announced they hired a brand new city development coordinator. And his first meeting was held at a community center. And the topic was you know, short term rentals and kind of what, what technology should we have to kind of control short term rentals from noise monitors to taxation systems like Avenue analytics and things like that. What clearly was much more than that. They had not only members from the city council there, people who were involved in the short term rental process. And you could see all the local people in the community who were, you know, outraged of this issue and outraged of short term rentals. Were you there? I was there sitting in the back. So you're seeing this all for the first time. For the first time. And I knew just from what happened in Baltimore, here we go again. Mm. And it just took, and it was, that was the week before the city council meeting. And then it boomed right on that agenda. And the city council was discuss and, uh, you know, discuss implementation of a brand new short term rental ordinance and changes to the you know, ordinance code and rezoning code. And there it just started like a tidal wave every single city council meeting for at least a, a year, um, until changes were made in April of 20, uh, 2022 to the, to the current ordinance. And I had this really interesting conversation. Uh, do you remember that uh, driver that we hired to take me to the airport? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, the, the Zachary's pick him up rides. Yeah. Oh my God. That guy's a talker. He's hilarious. <laughs> uh, but we had a really interesting conversation about uh, because he's not in the short-term rental industry. He is kind of in the tourism industry. He takes people around to the wineries. Uh, but we had an interesting conversation about how the rise in popularity of short-term rentals, and of course, he referred to them as Airbnbs, how it has um, played a role in a cycle. And the cycle was basically the demand uh, increased, and so the supply of these homes that were previously where people living there would live increased too, as did the prices of staying in the destination, which in turn, um, combined with the destination's growth and popularity, started to equate to a stress for the housing situation for those who are working in the winery industry or the tourism industry, the service industry. In fact, we had a, a conversation, you and I, with a, a young woman who, who was um, working at a, one of the wineries who said she couldn't find a place to live. And ultimately, as Zachary put it, those people will choose not to drive in from other destinations. They will choose to live elsewhere and work elsewhere. And in that process, tourists and visitors service will drop because they've been promised this lovely reputation and suddenly there's not enough quality workers and the entire reputation of the destination suddenly sinks and it perhaps reverses a cycle. First of all, 
Is any of that too extreme or do you agree mostly with those dynamics? I think it can be a little bit extreme. <laughs> um, I think it's a little bit, I do think it's a little bit extreme. I do agree with you. Know, certain folks w will move out, right? Because of, of higher, you know, there's low housing vacancy. I mean, it's going to be higher prices, number one. Uh, it's going to be higher rent prices, per housing prices, purchase prices, et cetera. Um, but this industry here also brings a ton of, of not only revenue, but financial support to the community and jobs. Um, so I, I kind of disagree with that a little bit, um, but I, I do agree uh, that it's, it's a bigger effect than just short-term rentals, um, in, in my opinion. Um, the, I would say the town here, the major industry, number one, is tourism that employs over 2,000 people. Uh, then you have the school system, the hospital, and I believe Walmart is number four. Uh, there are not, there, there is not enough employment-based and job base here to fuel the growing popularity of the town and people who have lived here. So that will ultimately push people out. But it's also the growth here is going to create new type of jobs, new careers that people haven't you know, been involved with before. Um, you know, hiring, for instance, for us, you know, we, we pay uh, full-time benefits, some of the top salaries for product managers and folks who are product managers, they didn't even know this was a kind of a role. This is not long-term product management, right? And so we're developing new jobs and, and new roles, but you know, the, the biggest thing does come down to affordable housing is, is an issue. And it's an issue for us. We have to pull folks in from Kerrville and, and Bernie and places like that, that are nearby, uh, you know, major, you know, towns as well within a 30 mile radius. Um, so it does have an effect, but I think that is on the most extreme end. When you do look at the data, it's a little bit less than that. And, um, I've heard by the way, that you are the top employer in Fredericksburg, just as a side note. That is, that is it. We're, we're working towards it. And that's a great thing to hear. A lot, a lot of our staff would definitely, <laughs> definitely say that. And, uh, that's, that's what we, you know, we want to be one of the top employers locally. That that's the goal. One of the natural responses, uh, across the country from anti short-term rental, um, advocates is these people don't live here. They're headquartered elsewhere and they're extracting from the community. And one other thing I think makes you really different, despite the fact that your part of your team may be located in another country, despite the fact uh, that your employees may be coming in from different destinations, and frankly, despite the fact that you um, didn't even live in Fredericksburg, right? Up until this past uh, yesterday or something, <laughs> you just moved here? Literally moved here last Thursday. <laughs> I've been commuting out of Austin since. So there's something about you showing up for these city council meetings, years on end, sitting through all these conversations, listening. Do you think there's something about that physical presence that resolves things? I, the physical presence, I don't, I don't think people understand, is, is key. If you do not show up, um, and speak and drive for change that you will not have, you will not be heard. If you think an email to your city council members and to the mayor is going to work, you're, you're mistaken. Um, uh, it does have some effect. Um, but being able to show up and speak with, speak with facts is, is key and really, you know, fight the legislation with pride and, and talk about the number of jobs, what you do for the community, how you all your, even though we have the team out of Honduras, we still have over 40 people locally here in this community that, that work for us and support this business. And, um, it's, it, it can be tiring, but if you don't show up, then what, what will win is the negativity, negativity and emotion I've learned wins more than data and facts. You know, how, how often do you drive by a car wreck at 60 miles an hour? You don't, you, everyone slows down, they look, they're in awe, but 
you could have the sunset on the very right side. You're still driving 60 miles an hour at the speed limit at the sunset. And then my point is that negativity and emotion will always win and it slows down. People really examine that more than the data and facts of what's happening in, in, in the present moment. But you really have to hit home on the data and facts and really push that forward. But with you know, folks who continue to say that short-term rentals are damaging the community, it's, it is such a complex argument. I don't think anyone's figured out the right decision because there, there has to be regulation. There has to be taxation. You know, let's get the bad actors and operators out of this business and, and let's go forward as a community together. But as an example in Fredericksburg, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I believe it was seven, it was either 7 million or 9 million total generated in, ho in hotel short-term rental occupancy taxes last year, 6 million of which were generated by short-term rentals for the community. If you look at that, just that tax basis right there, and then on top of it, if you drive down around the neighborhood, short-term rentals are the most up upkept, beautiful, I mean, beautiful homes on the block. They're pristine and you can see it, but then obviously it does lead to the argument of affordable housing, et cetera, and things like that. But we do do a lot for the community. And I think the entire industry with cities, we got to find what, what is the fine balance? And no one's figured that out because I'm in agreement. There has to be regulation. But also there can't be regulation that puts people out of business and, and prohibits and presses up against property rights at the same time. So what is the fine line? I, I, I don't have that answer. Um, but putting in strict regulation that prohibits uh, people from running out their own personal property and, and, and shuts down businesses isn't the right answer at the same time either. How much of this whole story do you think is people dealing with change which is hard i think that that's more than half um for you know as an example this morning i uh, was talking to your producer Stuart. i was trying to debate if i was going to hop on this this interview this morning or have to go to city council meeting to to speak um, and i was able to find um, our director of uh, owner relations to go on my my behalf but that's even happening as we speak right now, more changes to the zoning code and things like that. And they move, they move the meetings to times that are obviously very inconvenient for the, the for folks, you know, at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, majority of the community is working and they have kids, they're at work. They can't just miss to come to city council meeting to have their voice heard. And what I have found is it's more the population that um, is either retired um, or um, that uh, uh, can't show up or had the ability to show up. And that's, that's typically the folks who don't like the change. And that's really all that's, that's, that I see that's being heard. Um, and the council members, they do a phenomenal job. We, we, we had a brand new city council voted um, in this past May. They've all done a great job, but they're only hearing as much as they, they can hear. And it's, it's, it's very hard when, you know, obviously our owners are all over Texas, et cetera, like that. We have a lot of local owners as well, but it's very hard to really have your side heard and it's hard to get your side in the room. Um, so, but it really does, it, it's, it does come down to change. And I obviously didn't grow up in Fredericksburg, but you hear all the time, even from our staff, how much the city has changed. Um, but what, when, when you and I met, you, you know, you're quoting, you know, the, the parade is coming to town. You know, it can be paused. It can be stopped temporarily, but ultimately the parade's going to come. No, you can't pause it. You can't pause it. Wait, I can't let you do that to my quote. The quote is, the quote is, um, the parade, and this was a parade that I used to attend in Princeton, New Jersey. It started growing and eventually it was getting really big with floats and police tape and you needed permits to sell anything. And then suddenly it's on TV and it wasn't fun anymore. But the realization was that that parade was going to happen each year and you could either participate in it, you could sit on the side and watch it. But what you can't do is pause it. You can't stop the parade. It's coming through town. Correct. Correct. Sorry for you pushing the quote, but you said it perfect. And <laughs> the, 
the parade's not not stopping. And I think a lot of folks, hey, they might have grown up here in Fredericksburg, you know, three or four blocks from Main Street. And yes, they might have ridden, you know, they might have ridden their bike, you know, once upon a time in that neighborhood. Uh, but that's the the reality is, is that's that's not where where we are at today. And um, there's tons of communities, especially in Glipsy County and Fredericksburg, where, you know, there's HOAs and things where you don't have to you know, worry about any of that kind of stuff. But the reality is, too, is if you're riding a bike four blocks from Main Street today, it's probably not a good idea to have your kid, you know, where, where are you as the parent, I would argue, in that situation, because it's not not definitely a good idea. Uh, but number one is the town has changed so much in the last 20 years that the most of those blocks have been moved over to historic districts, and it's been all related to tourism. And the town has, has exploded. And the, the, you're not stopping that parade. And so at this point, how do we have a healthy change that everyone agrees with? Mm. And you can't get that if you're not part of the conversation. Correct. Correct. And what happened at the city council meeting about a month ago is that they were trying to make some more severe changes and that all got luckily squashed. But what the mayor, the new mayor in May, when he's sitting at, this is something that I even heard. I, and how all local politics work is pretty fascinating. But what was what came out of that city council meeting was a brand new task force created over the next 90 days with the mayor himself, uh, the head of our local short term uh, rental alliance, um, another uh, local competitor company owner is on that, another person who is on you know short has their own short term rentals on that task force, the head of a real estate like the Texas Real Estate uh, uh, Commission I believe or the Hill Country. Uh, real estate commissions on that. And then two other folks who completely want short-term rentals, you know, gone are all actually coming together where I think it's a fascinating idea, but it's just suddenly out of a brand new proposal that's going to happen. They're going to present their findings and, you know, in 90 days. So it's, it's pretty fascinating watch because I've never heard that before, but I think it's a great idea bringing all of all the folks in the room to talk about what a healthy change looks like. But to your point, everyone now has a seat at the table from all angles of, of an opinion. So it is key um, to not only show up locally, but just because it's happening here in Fredericksburg tomorrow, you know, we operate in New Brunfels, Canyon Lake. Who's to say it's not just going to go there the next? And Matt, we had the chance to uh, hang out in uh, Nashville in August at our first ever Keystone retreat. And I'm curious just to sum up, you know, there's so many things to think about in being a responsible vacation rental professional. And so many of them are painful and at the surface layer and just right there in front of you. But as you really do some of the deep work, the real problem solving, the real peeling back the layers, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing a, a takeaway uh, from that retreat that ch maybe changed the way you're thinking about the future. I will say that, you know, and I, and I was even when I got interviewed afterwards, you know, from, from that retreat, I truly believe that I learned, you know, more in three days than I had in the last three years. Because what I realized was well, you, you hear about it at these conferences, right? You're able to talk to the company owners for, you know, 30 minutes here, the 20 minutes there. And um, uh, you really don't get to do a deep dive into true problems that we all face. Um, uh, and yes, we're all in mastermind groups for an hour and things like that, but three full days at, uh, you know, at a farm offsite and a think tank. What I really realize is that we are all one giant ecosystem together. We're very fragmented, but we all have some of the same you know, dynamic problems across every single town and every single business. We might do things differently. Um, you know, someone might have more web traffic and direct bookings than the other, as, as an example. But we are all so interconnected that it's not even even funny. And for the health of the industry and where we're all going, it, it is critical that we all work together, even though we're all these different markets, to share ideas and to grow this industry to a lesser fragmented 
point and uh, having a get and, and really thinking about it. And, you know, I got to give credit to Travis Wilburn um, of State Charlottesville. You know, he said it, you know, we don't know the industry's at a point where, yes, you know, we're big CASA and people might know the trips and some of the big other companies, but right now I don't know who the best vacation rental company is in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I don't know when I go to Charlottesville, who's the best vacation rental company. I think that's where I see the industry going is hopefully people understanding of some of the best operators and best, you know, businesses to stay that are all hopefully interconnected into the futures where I, where I see it going, but we all have so much to offer as company owners, but it's very hard for us to share those ideas at, at conferences and to really stay connected uh, at a really deep discussion level. Beautiful. Do you have any wishes for um, the industry over the next year or predictions? I think it's, we're, we're going to have to, you know, tight, tighten our belts, number one, to preserve the revenues that we do earn. I think in certain markets, you're really going to find um, just lower, lower occupancies, maybe not as much lower ADRs, but I was just on a mastermind group with Michelle Marquis of uh, Track Hospitality Solutions and about 10 other company owners. And, and it was the same theme across all of us, you know, especially you know, for us here at Coast Vacation Rolls and Fredericksburg, the majority of our unit growth has been from 2020, 2021, and 2022, when we all rode that high wave of just guest, you know, unprecedented guest demand of ADRs, you know, people coming, getting out of the cities of Austin and Dallas and Houston. And it was the same for a lot of us. And, you know, now that wave's over and a lot of people who bought at the very top of that market, they're the ones who are suffering the most because now, hey, we're back to kind of a, you know, the more mainstream of what Fredericksburg is in demand, where it's typically a Thursday through Sunday town. There's two different high seasons a year. There's there's slow points, but over the last two years, it really hasn't been that much of a slow point. So I think it really, over the next year, we are one of our biggest priorities is education and transparency. Um, and education, not only to our staff, but to all of our owners um, and showing them the data, showing the revenue, showing what our forecasts are. I think that's the big, big thing that people are going to be challenging over the course of the next year, especially for, like I said, for the people who bought at the highs, because there's only going to be so much revenue left over when someone bought at the top of the market, when they're only, let's just say they're left with 80%, the management company is 20% of the typical homeowner cost. So it's going to be an interesting year for a lot of those folks. And, I, you know, if I was those type of homeowners, I would love to not only have that education, but have that transparency so I can be proactive in making my decisions. But I think management companies really just need to, it's, it's, it's pulling a lever. I think it's going to be by the month to see where this market go, is going. Um, if, you know, further recession comes and, you know, market drops higher interest rate, et cetera. But, I think you've really got to get a grip on your business and really monitor you know, your, your company financials as well as monitoring rates in the market and really educating your homeowners. What a rich interview. I plan on listening to this again once it's really had a chance to marinate and sink in. But my big takeaway, not just from this conversation, but from watching Matt mature as a businessman over the years since he was back in Baltimore, my big takeaway is the differentiating power of an operating system. I think most of us have the instinct. That's why we got into this business when we did. Most of us have the gift, even the passion for hospitality. But what not all of us had, in fact, I'd argue most of us don't, is the discipline to create a true operating system. And it's not intuitive, it's not easy, it does not happen overnight. In fact, in Matt's case, it took more than two years and over $100,000. But I believe it was the commitment, the decision from Matt to build a business that did not depend on himself that 
was the mental game changer. And you do not have to manage 300 plus properties in order to begin building your own version of an operating system that consists of standards, procedures, how we do things when they arise, to begin hiring people for those roles and responsibilities, and to find ways to get your team, even if it's small, two or three people, onto the same page so that everybody knows what one another is doing. That discipline is not easy and it does not happen overnight, but it is the big differentiator. It is what makes a quintessential wave rider move. If this message resonates with you, consider joining Matt and me and Emily Reed and over a thousand vacation rental operators in VRMB communities. We are actively building the quintessential wave rider businesses of the future. You can join us at vrmb.com slash join. And Matt also referenced our Keystone Retreat. We'll be hosting another private operator retreat this coming February in Georgia. And if you'd like to learn more about that event, please just send an email introduction to Matt with two T's at vrmb.com. Until next time.